Hi, how you doing? Good, I hope. Oh, I read a fascinating book. It's called The Secret Lives of Mark Rich by the King of Oil, is who he was, by Daniel Ammon. This is a fascinating book. It's so chock full of educational information speaking of globalism and foreign trade. I read the flap. Billionaire oil trader Mark Rich for the first time talks at length about his private life, including his expensive divorce from his wife Denise, his invention of the spot oil market which made his fortune and changed the world ec economy. His lucrative and unpublicized dealings with Al Ayatollah Khomeini's Iran, Fidel Castro's Cuba, war ravaged Angola, and apartheid South Africa. His quiet cooperation with the Israeli and U.S. governments, even after he was indicted for tax fraud by Rudy Giuliani, and near comical attempts by U.S. officials to kidnap him illegally. This sure to make headlines book is the first no holes barred biography of Rich, who was famously pardoned by Bill Clinton and resurfaced in the news during the confirmation hearings of Attorney General Eric Holder. It sheds stunning new light on one of the most controversial international businessmen of all time charting Rich's rise from the Holocaust, which he fled as a young boy to become the wealthiest and most powerful oil and com commodities trader of the century. From his earliest trading days to the present, Mark Rich's story is astonishing and compelling. And indeed it is. And the writer, Daniel Ammon, is business editor of the highly regarded Swiss Weekly, Die Wilfwalk. He was educated at Zurich University, UC Berkeley, and Foundation Postno Verister International in Paris. In 2007, he won the George von Holtzbrink Prize for Business Journalism. All right, Daniel. Thumbs up. Okay. Yes. This story is fascinating, and it's got a lot in here to show how this man actually rigged up these high oil prices. Oh, yes, and not just oil, but commodities, too. And commodities is kind of a split market from the big basic, basics such as oil. Now, here's another little part <clears throat> that I wanted to tell you about. Oh, I know it's going to tempt you to read it. American Legal Isol Isolationism on page starts on page 130. The American authorities were unaware of the importance of a provisional arrest. Usually the key to a successful extradition is the provisional arrest of the fugitive. Alvin D. Lodish later explained in this matter. Lodish served as a senior trial attorney with the Office of International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Justice. Many cases are quickly resolved after the provisional arrest has been perfected. The requirements for provisional arrest are significantly, significantly less burdensome than the requirements for the full extradition. <clears throat> Independent observers have also been critical of U.S. legal actions in the case of Mark Rick Rich. The Mark Rich litigation has been a case study in how not to achieve successful intergovernmental cooperation, criticized J. Ross, Ross McDonald, one of the leading tax experts in the United States. The American authorities ignored interest balancing entirely in this case, admonished Harold G. Meyer who served as a counselor on international law to the U.S. State Department at the time. <clears throat> the sharpest confrontations and the ones with the greatest potential for disrupting 
amicable political and economic relations occur when the United States seeks to use its power over persons or entities before its courts or agencies to enforce its policies by requiring or prohibiting acts or omissions abroad that are contrary to the laws or policies of the foreign territorial sovereign. And that made me think about the American companies that have moved to foreign nations. Hmm. Meyer's opinion, which asserts that such, such actions only serve to harm the United States, leaves no room for doubt. Protection of sovereign rights is not solely or even primarily for the benefit of individual nations. It is in the interest of the general community as well. In those instances where a direct clash of sovereign policies and assertion of United States enforcement jurisdiction will inevitably lead to requiring acts contrary to the legitimate wishes of a foreign sovereign in its own territory, United States courts should indulge the strong presumption that international law and thus the law of the United States does not permit such interference. The damage caused by American legal isolationism in the case of Mark Rich was also highlighted by the British economist Alan Neal, a world authority on international law. It is hard to avoid the conclusion that claims to U.S. jurisdiction which have been enroached on the sovereign rights of other countries have been largely been a disaster for the United States. In the Mark Rich case, the insistence of the U.S. Department of Justice on enforcing U.S. court subpoenas against the Swiss Incorporated Company combined with a curiously negligent approach to obtaining the documents held by the associated U.S. company was wholly ineffective. Why were Guglielmo and Weinberg so uncooperative in their dealings with Swiss authorities? Why did they fail to take advantage of so many opportunities? Why did they choose to allow the case to escalate? Guglielmo refused several times to be interviewed or answer written questions, even though I took great pains to reschedule an interview that would fit in with his schedule. <clears throat> Weinberg was visibly annoyed when I brought up the inconsistencies surrounding the matter of Rich's extradition during our interview in his office. We don't do the extraditions, he finally said. The extradition is handled through the Department of Justice, through the Office of International Affairs in Washington. When I provoked him by suggesting that he must have been pleased with the case's escalation, Weinberg answered after a brief pause. The Swiss actions help me. Oh, and isn't it interesting how small Switzerland is, but how rich it is, and can do a lot of things in other countries. And another part, <clears throat> if it had not been for that business, a business deal whose legitimacy or illegality had never been determined in court, Mark Rich would certainly have never been painted as, as the biggest devil. If it had not been for the economically, economically counterproductive price controls imposed by President Richard Nixon, Rich would have never have acquired a reputation as the biggest tax evader in U.S. history. Instead, Rich would still be known today as the genius in the formerly European-dominated metals market as he was once regarded. Had it not been for Rich's fall from grace, people would speak of him today as the American hero who broke Big Oil's cartel and invented the spot market for the trade in crude oil. He would be described as the embodiment of the American dream, the poor immigrant who would later become a billionaire and a generous philanthropist. For it is the American virtues the American values, and yes, the American vices rich in bodies that make him the king of oil. Work harder. Concentrate on your goal. Think big and bold. Be aggressive. Be successful. 
Of course, one can criticize Rich for supplying South Africa's apartheid regime with oil. One can criticize Rich for trading with dictators of every stripe, from Cuba's Fidel Castro to Nigeria's Sani Abaka <clears throat> and Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini. And of course, one can criticize him for breaking embargoes while putting profit above morality. It would be easy to criticize Rich for all of these business dealings were the ways of the world as simple as black and white. The reality, however, is much more complicated than that. Life does not always play out according to preconceived notions. Life isn't always what it seems. A trader who has dealt in virtually every metal for Mark Rich illustrated this point to me quite clearly. I was speaking to him about commodities trading in a bar <clears throat> in wintry Midtown Manhattan. Ethics. He laughed. Then he pointed at my Diet Coke. Your Coke is made of aluminum. The bauxite that is needed to make it probably comes from Guinea Conakry. A terrible dictatorship, believe me, he said. That the oil that is used to heat this room probably comes from Saudi Arabia. These good friends of the USA hacked the hands off thieves, just like in the Middle Ages. Your cell phone? Without Coltrane there, there wouldn't be any cell phones. Let's not pretend. Coltrane was used to finance the Civil War in the Congo. He paused for his words to take effect. Now tell me, he said, and pointed his finger at me. What's the alternative? No trade? Without raw materials, the economy would collapse. The earth would stand still. <clears throat> Do the people who criticize our work want to know any of this, or would they rather just pick on us so they can feel better about themselves? These are questions for which only ideologues have an easy answer. Everyone else, the commodities traders, most of all, of course, make do with some middle way between a sense of reality and self-deception. Sometimes they look reality in the eye, and sometimes they would rather forget about it. They live in a gray area, sometimes dark, sometimes light. Sometimes it is fair and sometimes it is exploitive. The name for this gray area is capitalism. <clears throat> Strolling through the snowy gardens of the Villa Rose, I thought of an intriguing question. The John Templeton Foundation had recently asked leading scientists, economists, scholars, and public figures, do the free markets corrode moral character? It depends, John Gray, an emetrious professor at the London School of Economics, answered. The traits of character most rewarded by free markets, he said, as if he had been asked to comment on Mark Rich, or entrepreneurial boldness, the willingness to speculate and gamble, and the ability to seize or create new opportunities, Gray added. It is worth noting that these are not the traits most praised by conservative moralists. Yes, a senior Mark Rich plus company director with vast experience all over the world once confessed to me. Sometimes we had to make a Faustian bargain to clinch the deal. The words resonated in my head for quite some time. A Faustian bargain. Nowadays this phrase is usually used to describe self-serving actions and moral sacrifices. A pact with the devil in order to gain power, wealth, or influence. But in Faust, the tragedy. Johann Wolfgang Von Goethe's greatest work, the scholar Heinrich Faust, is not simply a ruthless egotist. He represents men who strive for achievement and want to test their own limitations. Faust stands for the scientist who breaks conventions in order to discover what holds the world together in its innermost. He is also misled, someone who would purchase short-term profit with long-term pain. We we may see Mark Rich as a kind of modern Faust of the commodity age. He is not unlike Faust, a driven individual who strives for success and recognition. He perfected trading methods precisely because he was willing to push the boundaries and break taboos. His power also came from trading with the devils of the world. So you see, the devils are real. And I hope you stay away from it.
Wow. I suggest you read this book. Have a nice one. Day or night, wherever you are. Later.